All right. So for everyone who's here, welcome to the second live session of the CNU Florida Virtual Summit. We're very thrilled to have Chuck Marone here, president and founder of Strong Towns. Having him here would be possible without the support of the APA Florida Capital Area Section. So we want to thank you for that sponsorship. And we're excited to hear what Chuck has to present about the Local Leaders Toolkit and exciting things Strong Towns is working on. A heads up on the format today, Chuck has a presentation. It's about 60 minutes, but we want to save some time for Q&A at the end. Um, given the high attendance rate of the conference and the session, it limits our ability to have live dialogue. So we ask that you submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. And we'll make sure Chuck has access to those so we can respond at the end. My name is Laurel. If you have any questions or technical issues throughout this presentation, use the chat function and I'll address them as best I can. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chuck and let him present a Local Leaders Toolkit Strong Towns response to the pandemic. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Laurel. Uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, it is um, three o'clock here in Minnesota where I'm at. And for this very brief period of time, uh, the sun comes through the tiny part of the window up there that I have not been able to cover in the studio. So I, I have this weird reflection on my, uh, my front side. So just... Uh, Bear with me. Uh, it's usually, uh, it, it, will, it will pass. We love the sunshine here in Minnesota because of course, in another few weeks, uh, it will be a little bit different. I am trying to share my screen. So whoever has screen sharing is gonna have to enable that for me to, uh, to share my, uh, my stuff here. Uh, while they're setting that up, let me give you just a brief uh, introduction to myself and to Strong Towns. Uh, my name is Chuck Marone. I'm the president and founder of Strong Towns. Strong Towns, uh, our mission is to support a model of development that allows our cities, towns, and neighborhoods to become financially strong and resilient. Uh, I started a blog back in 2008. I actually, after many years of working as an engineer, as a planner in cities all over Minnesota, I started to write about my experiences, uh, largely about projects that I had worked on, uh, particularly their financial, uh, the, the financial side of it. And one of the things that I had experienced over and over is that the projects that I was doing, which are very standard kind of, you know, modern development fair, uh, everything from just plain, you know, the developer builds a road with all the utilities and the city takes it over uh, to things that were far more complicated involving tax subsidies and what have you. Um, all of these projects financially were net losers for the community. They all generated cash flow in the short term uh, and so had a short term benefit. But as soon as we started to take in the long term costs of servicing and maintaining this, uh, <clears throat> financially, these went deep into the hole. And it, after writing about this for a, a while, some friends of mine encouraged me to start a nonprofit. They actually did all the heavy lifting. Uh, we started Strong Towns back in 2009. Uh, got our 501c3 at the end of 2010, and I have spent uh, the last decade traveling around the country uh, doing presentations like this, uh, as well as now we have an, an entire team of people who publish two or three articles a day through our website, very active on social media, uh, have three different podcast streams that we do. And of course, now that COVID-19 is, is, uh, is a part of our life, now that we're all deep into this pandemic, I've been doing a lot of these web broadcasts. Uh, I, I lament the fact that we can't all be together. Uh, I think outside of Texas, uh, Florida is the state that I have visited the most as part of my work with Strong Towns. So many of you on the line have probably heard me speak in person before or had an opportunity to, uh, to chat with me. Um, this is going to be something completely different because this is something we just did uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, but maybe just say thank you to, to get started and, and sad that we can't all be together, hopefully very soon. I was actually in Florida uh, on March um, 11th when, uh, if you remember that date, that was the date that uh, the NBA season got postponed. Uh, the NCAA tournament got canceled. Um, Tom Hanks was announced to have uh, COVID, uh, the coronavirus. And uh, we were having a, a retreat. Our, our team works all over the country. We get together a couple times a year. Uh, one of them we try to do at Disney World. It's a great place to hold a meeting, standing in lines, waiting to go on rides. Uh, makes me a very popular person to work for uh, when we do it that way. We were uh, out bowling 
And uh, all these things started flashing on. And we had a, a day planned at actually at Hollywood Studios the next day. Um, the next day we got up, did a little bit of work at the Airbnb and everybody got on flights and went home. Uh, it was very quickly after that, you know, stock market falling, uh, unemployment skyrocketing, uh, cities and, and, and local leaders started to contact us and say, what, what do we do? Like, this is a disaster. This is bad. Um, we're dealing with problems on multiple fronts. What do we do? What, what is a strong town's response? And so we wrote a series of articles uh, on our site that, that tried to answer that question in a, in a comprehensive way, tried to help local officials think through what was going on and think about how to position themselves to respond. We ultimately put those into a toolkit, and I'm going to give you that uh, web address at the end here today. Uh, but we're going to go through the different aspects of that toolkit and kind of walk you through what a strong town's response to this pandemic looks like and how you can position your city for what comes next. Um, I wanna start with this conversation that we had internally early on about a mental shift. A, a big part of this toolkit deals with actual things to go out and do, but a lot of it deals with a, a shift in thinking, a change in how we view uh, our role, ourselves, our communities. Um, the first one I wanna talk about is this distinction between leaders and managers. Um, and I'm, I want to say right up front that I don't look at these as good and bad. I look at these as two different types of people that are best fit for a, a certain uh, role. Um, managers are very important. And when you have a task that needs to be carried out, when you have something you want carried out well, carried out right, uh, a manager is the exact right person. But as we're going to see here in a second, uh, a manager is very different than someone who is a leader. Leaders have followers. Uh, managers tend to have subordinates. They are managing a project. They're, they're working within a certain time frame. But leaders are people who are, are going and they have to have people who actually follow them and follow them, fill in the gaps behind them. Leaders responsibly break rules. Uh, as you're going to see in this toolkit, uh, in order to respond, we need to break some rules. We need to color outside the lines in many ways. Uh, administers tend to, uh, or managers, I'm sorry, tend to administer guidelines. They uh, say, you know, what are the rules? The rules are in place for a reason. We're administering them. There's a time and a place for that is very important, but, but now is not that time. Along with responsibly breaking the rules, leaders encourage risk instead of uh, playing it safe. Uh, leaders are selling a vision of, of what, of transformation, of, of something that is different. They're, they're selling people on what could be. Managers tend to sell projects, uh, projects that fulfill uh, stated objectives. Uh, and I think most importantly for where we're at right now, leaders see opportunity, uh, particularly in crisis. Uh, managers see potential points of failure. Uh, we need who are leaders. Uh, managers have a role uh, in different periods of time. Uh, we can benefit a lot from having very competent, very good managers running things. Uh, but right now, we need to make room for the leaders in our community and not only make room for them, call them actually to step up and be part of this transition that we're going through, be part of setting us up to emerge from this pandemic as stronger, more prosperous places. Our toolkit is split into three sections. And the three sections are really phasing sections. The first one is like, what do we do immediately? What do we do right now? And for many of you, as we go through this, you'll find things that you have done. Uh, there's a lot, I mean, the CNU itself is full of people who have leadership type mentality. And uh, for those of you actively working in your communities, you may find a lot of these things you've already done. Uh, there might be some that are new to you that you can get going on. Uh, the second part then is, is kind of the midterm phase. What do we do once we've kind of settled things down and got things stable? How do we then work uh, towards a, a healthy transition? And then the third step is, what do we look at one year and beyond? What's coming in the future and how do we set ourselves up for that? So let's start with the beginning, the first 60 days. And, and I said, there's, there's a lot of ways we need to shift our thinking and there's a lot of things we can do. Each of these sections starts with a, a shift in thinking. Uh, when we think about, you know, those first early days of the pandemic, um, what we are, are, are really looking at uh, is a situation where nobody knew quite what was going on. Um, 
in many ways, we know a lot more now, uh, but that extra knowledge has not really added a lot of clarity, uh, particularly at the local level where there's a lot of ambiguity, uh, there's a lot of unknowns still at play. Um, what we have seen, and you know, please excuse uh, what I'm gonna say, uh, is not meant to be a, a partisan statement, um, but more of a systems kind of observation. Uh, our response to this at the national level has been clumsy. Uh, I, I, it's the word I've kind of chosen to use is clumsy. Um, I think history will have many things to say about our national response. Uh, some of them good, some of them you know, not so good. Uh, obviously a pandemic is not something we deal with all the time. And so you would expect a little bit of clumsiness. Uh, but, you know, the response has been clumsy because of this. Uh, it really is even more imperative that local leaders shift their thinking to not wait for other people, to not look and say, what's the, you know, the latest from this organization or the thing we should do here? Uh, you know, not wait for someone else, but to actually step up, uh, to be leaders, to seize the moment, uh, as we say here. Um, in doing that, we need our cities to start a, a process of orienting themselves horizontally as opposed to vertically. Um, when we look at local government today, particularly local government as it's adapted to itself since the New Deal, since the end of World War II, and since you know, rapid suburbanization, local governments have been positioned at the bottom of an, uh, you know, we can think of as like an ecosystem of governments, a food chain of governments. Local government sits at the bottom with regional government, state government, and federal government, and, and in some senses, you know, world government being, uh, in a sense, higher orders of magnitude. Um, local governments positioned in this way kind of sit at the bottom of this food chain and orient up to you know, see what, what is the capital flows we can tap into? What's the program that we're supposed to implement? What is the, uh, the dictate that we are supposed to receive? Very proactive leadership in this time starts to look at their community not as the lowest rung in an ecosystem of government, but as the highest level of coordination uh, of people living in a community. And so when we orient horizontally towards the people in our community, what we see is that a, a whole range of insights open up to us. Uh, the third thing here is to be a, a voice of unity. Um, I don't have to say this. I, I think we all understand that we live in divisive and polarized times. Uh, there was a podcast I was listening to just this morning from a, a person that I generally find to be pretty level-headed, uh, talking at length about ideas such as civil wars and secession and the country breaking up. Uh, you know, I don't think that that is what is in store, but the fact that those things are part of our dialogue tells us that we live in very interesting times indeed. Uh, I'm not asking people to not, uh, you know, vest in the current approach, to not have opinions, uh, to not be able to state those opinions, but especially at the local level, when we are trying to lead communities, we have to be very careful about the words we use, uh, the way we go about things, because we need uh, everybody. Um, in order for a city to work, and this is kind of a core strong town's tenant, we need people who are of progressive disposition. We need people who are of conservative disposition. Uh, we need that yin and yang working together at the local level to solve complex problems. And so when we, in a sense, allow ourselves to be captured by this you know, very partisan zeitgeist and allow that to filter down so that our, our local city council meetings uh, sound like, you know, a left and right crossfire uh, or what have you, or our dialogue at the coffee shop or at, you know, whatever place we're trying to talk to people to accomplish something good takes on the, that aura of top-down partisanship. Um, what is happening is we are limiting our capacity to do productive things. And so we strongly encourage people do what you can, take that extra step uh, to be a voice of unity. And you can't, if you can't be a voice of unity, at least don't be a voice of disunity. And then along with that step up, the idea of seize the moment of like, there's nobody going to do this for us. We have to step up and we have to do it. So what are we recommending people do immediately? And like I said, a lot of these things at this point, we have seen communities deal with. Uh, if, if one of these is still on your list, it's not too late to get started. We, we need to get people fed. We need to get people shelter. 
Um, these are like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, obviously, the, you know, the first thing, how, how are people going to eat? Where are people going to stay? Um, there have been some great initiatives we've seen uh, in my hometown. The school district took this on. Uh, we've seen local churches. We've seen mosques and synagogues. Uh, we've seen nonprofit organizations step up and say, uh, here's how we're going to feed people. Uh, we're not suggesting that this is like the job of local government. Local government should do this, but local government can be a conduit or a support system uh, for those places that have the expertise and the capacity to do these things. Um, we see that there have been uh, moratoriums across the country on evictions and on uh, you know foreclosures, but those are winding down if they haven't wound down in your area already. And so we see this kind of wave of people who are experiencing uh, difficulty finding a place to live, finding shelter. We need, again, to work with those organizations we have in our community that are geared up to do this to make sure that that is a top priority so that people are fed and people have a place to stay. Uh, we need to support the public health response. And I, I know is, is an interesting way that this has become itself politicized. At the local level, we have to be very careful to not let that happen. Um, you know, there is a public health response uh, again, I'll use the word clumsy. It's been clumsy at times, but I think the idea of being a focal point, a point of coordination, a point of interpretation from what that public health response is to our communities and then back the other direction uh, is a very helpful thing that we can do right now. Um, I, we put this in here and it's, it's interesting because I probably get more questions about this thing than anything when I've given this presentation or had this conversation. Uh, connect masks to economic recovery. I did a podcast back in March. Uh, you can go back and listen to it about how Americans would not wear masks. And uh, it, it, it's, it's sad how prophetic that has actually become in some ways. Um, when we look at, and, and I think this is the baffling thing about like the early days of the CDC, uh, you know, not recommending that people wear masks. Uh, when we look at just the uh, you know, the idea of any kind of viral transmission. Um, it's very clear that wearing a mask is the way you transition your society from being one where everybody has to be home and people can't interact with each other to one where people are able to go about and do things. Um, a mask is one of those things that uh, in terms of like the upside to downside, um, has, you know, it, it's, it's unlike a vaccine. It's unlike uh, any kind of medical intervention where there's, you know, positive risk if it works out and negative risk if it doesn't. The negative risk for wearing a mask is literally a, a little bit of discomfort from a personal level. Uh, you know, that there, there may be other risks that you perceive in terms of individual liberty and what have you, but as an individual, uh, you know, the, the, the downside risk you have is discomfort. The upside risk is that you don't catch a virus. And so when you look at that asymmetry of risk and payback, uh, it's a very easy thing. And that's why we were talking about masks in early March here at Strong Towns. The important thing for us when we're having conversations about masks, we're having conversations about how we uh, get our economy going again, that we connect these two things and that we connect them together without any ancillary other things. I've seen so many people uh, try to, I will even say make fun of people, uh, impugn them, uh, start you know, getting upset over the, uh, the public health aspects of wearing masks. I get that, I get that passion, I respect it, I understand it. Um, but our role here is to get our local economy stable, to get those small businesses stable, to get people back to work. Um, we have to get beyond uh, you know, shaming people or having some type of debate over the public health aspect of this. And we need to be able to say to people, whether you like it or not, these businesses are going to close. This community is going to go under. We are going to be hurting for jobs and, 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 and you know, all the things that you fear about taxes going up and services going down, all of these things we can start to address in a proactive manner if we can just get people wearing masks. Because if we can get people wearing masks, we are one step closer to getting the economy going again, particularly that local economic ecosystem that's so important. Um, we need to provide people space. I think this is going to be more important now as we go into the winter again. 
uh, you know, and people tend to stay inside more. Uh, there's maybe a, a little bit less uh, gathering. Um, but the mental health of people, particularly when we have lockdowns and we have periods of time where people don't feel safe going out, is really, really important. Um, one of the things that is easy to kind of note is that we've been using our streets less. There's been less traffic. There's been less driving. Uh, and, and, and more need for people to have distance from each other in a physical sense. The idea of turning some of that street space into space where people can go out and be, and be distanced from each other, but yet have that mental health aspect of getting out of, of their quarantine, getting out of their space and enjoying uh, some public realm uh, is a very, very important part of a public health response to this pandemic. Um, along with that, we are encouraging cities to go easy on enforcement. Um, there is no mask mandate. Uh, there is no social distancing mandate that is going to work in the United States of America based on police presence. Um, the way we do this is by getting everybody on the same team. And I realize it's going to be frustrating at times because not everyone's going to want to join, you know, the team. Uh, but if we go out and make it about heavy handed enforcement, like we've seen in some cities, uh, what we see is that backlash. And what we really want is we want people to feel a commitment to doing this together because this is what's going to help our place. Um, we need to, as local leaders, support adaptation, particularly in the small business community. Um, we like to point out, and I'm going to go into depth in this in a sec, that we don't have all the answers. Uh, we don't know how to fix every business. We don't know how long this pandemic is even going to go on. Um, what we have to do is we have to be very tolerant and very accepting of people who are trying out new things, trying to figure out how to make things work. Um, along those lines, at government level, one of the things that we can do right now is to just collect data. And we have a lot of people in local government that are not, um, the job that they normally do is not an urgent job at this moment. Those are people that can be retasked, can be, you know, have their job switched temporarily so that they are collecting data for us, calling our small businesses saying, hey, where are you stuck? What are you struggling with? What can we help out with? Calling people and finding out, you know, where are we having a difficult time? What are we missing out here? That data is critically important. And most part, local governments are not set up to get it and not set up to get it in the real time that they need. And then finally, uh, preserve cash. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know where we're going to be uh, six months from now, 12 months from now, two years from now. Um, what we do know is that local government is very important and local communities are very important. Uh, they're literally like the first line of making things work. If we become insolvent, if we fail, if we are incapable at the local level of doing the things we need to do, people are going to suffer. And so it's important for us not to, in a sense, uh, jump, you know, jump at things uh, and throw money at them the way we are in times prone to do, but to actually take a more prudent approach. And this is where I want to talk about small business. Um, there was a, a, a rush in many places in the early days, and we still see this now percolating through the system, of wanting to do something to help small businesses. Uh, we can look around and in my community, uh, the Walmart is open, the Target store is open, the Costco is open, all the franchise drive through restaurants, the McDonald's and the Taco Bell and what have you, they're, they're all open and seemingly doing like gangbusters business. What is not open or what has been struggling to figure out how to stay open? The clothier in the downtown, the restaurants in the downtown, the local coffee shop, um, the places that are part of our uh, you know, small business economic ecosystem. Um, there's a, a tendency to say, let's take the resources we have and throw it at this problem. In my community, we actually went and gave every one of these small businesses that wanted it $3,000. And you look at it, and for my town, uh, that was a lot of money. We have a very small budget. Uh, many of you come from different size cities. Uh, try to proportion up you know, a healthy size of your budget, just distributed to businesses with the idea that we would keep them afloat. Um, I did not find that helpful. And I don't think that that ultimately will prove to be helpful. Um, I'm not suggesting that they didn't appreciate it. And I'm not suggesting this didn't help out. But if the goal is to have this economic ecosystem, to have these small businesses and have them 
six months from now, 12 months from now, two years from now, I don't think that a short little cash infusion that is not going to happen again because we don't have the money is going to really address that, solve that, meet that broader public policy objective. What would? Um, what would would be going out and helping people figure out how to adapt, how to change. One of the very awkward things that we did is we said, okay, um, we're going to allow our restaurants to have uh, seating now in some of the parking spaces. Those parking spaces aren't being used. Let's reconfigure them so that they can have seating out there. And a great thing to, which is a great idea and a great thing to do would have been to go out and meet with those businesses and say, all right, how do we make this happen? What are the things we have to kind of clear out of your way to allow you to do this? Um, maybe we got to go talk to the police chief or the fire chief to square this all away. Maybe we have to, you know, whatever the little issues are that we can run interference for them so that they, the small business, can focus on the things they need to do, the adaptation. In my community, we did the opposite. We said, all right, um, we're going to allow this. Here's the four-page permit form you have to fill out. Here's the fee you would have to pay. And here's the process you would have to go through to have street seating. What the hell are people doing at City Hall all this time? What, what, why weren't we out there trying to, like I said, run interference for them? Instead of giving them three grand uh, to help them float for a month or two, actually figuring out how they can be viable as a business and giving them the room and the flexibility to do that is much, much more important and going to have a far greater long-term impact on these places. All right. What do we do in the midterm? And how do we think about shifting from this kind of immediate thing where we're immediately deploying our resources in response to uh, a crisis to now starting to get into where things are more chronic? We're dealing with something over a, over a, a, a longer transition. The, the first shift in mental thinking is really important. And I, I, I say this one and people want to push back on it. And, and, and I think don't push back on it in, 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 in real sense, but like their mind wants to reject it because we're human, right? Recovery is not going to mean restoration. Uh, recovery is not going to mean that we go back to March 10th, uh, 2020. Uh, it's not going to mean that our cities are somehow transported back to what 2019 looked like. Um, we can see this in the, uh, the financial markets and the bond markets. Uh, we can see that, you know, the future for cities uh, in terms of their ability to borrow, uh, the things that they're, uh, you know, going to have the capacity to do uh, looks very, very different than, you know, even the last decade. Uh, we can see this uh, just in, in kind of this building up of, uh, of, of issues and problems, whether it's a backlog of maintenance, whether it's a backlog of pension commitments, um, whatever it is, all of the plans and opportunities that we had to address those things have now been thrown out. Uh, and, and, and we are, in a sense, starting over from scratch, but starting over in a position of deep, deep vulnerability and fragility. We need to not think about clawing our way back to the way things were. We need to think about recovery as being recovering to something different, something hopefully better, but something different. Um, to get there, the second shift in thinking becomes important. Um, we need to work towards community self-sufficiency, fully knowing that we're not going to get all the way there. One of the things that we found right away in this pandemic is that we're very, very fragile in a number of ways. I, I don't know if you in Florida had the toilet paper crisis, but we did here, um, you know, where nobody could get toilet paper for a short period of time. Uh, our supply chains for that broke down uh, and you had all this panic buying. Um, we have seen now as the uh, harvesting season has gone on that there have been uh, hiccups in terms of how things were planted, how things were cared for, how things were harvested. Um, we uh, saw a, a, a number of fragilities in our supply chain. I'll give you one that has personally affected me. In April, I ordered a freezer. Um, we have a garden and uh, I wanted to expand our garden and put some of that away in a, in a bigger freezer. And so I ordered a bigger freezer. Uh, it is the end of September. Uh, the freezer still not arrived. It was scheduled to arrive in three weeks or four weeks. Uh, that has been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Now, 
we're not going to get to the place where we can have, you know, ma- all of our cities will manufacture their own freezers or manufacture their own automobiles or their own iPods. Uh, but we can start with things that we can do and lower our degree of fragility. I'm going to talk about one of those here in the next slide. Um, and then over the short term, there is a trade-off that we need to recognize, a trade-off between growth and stability. This is kind of a core theme at Strong Towns. Uh, we can have growth. And if growth is our primary uh, objective, we can give up our stability. We can become less stable as a community, less stable as a place. Uh, we can become more fragile in order to experience that growth. That's an easy, easy trade-off. Uh, one of the, like, here's examples of this is borrowing money uh, to give to small businesses to keep them afloat. Uh, that will give us some growth. That will give us some, you know, a uh, little bit of uptick today. But over the long term, now we have this debt, we have this obligation that will be a long term on us and rob us of options in the future. It's important for us to recognize as we're making decisions here in this transition phase that everything we do is going to be a trade-off between growth and stability. Uh, We need to emphasize stability. We want to experience growth. Growth is a very good thing, like a sunny day. Sunny days are great. Um, But we can't have a system that relies on every day being sunny. We have to be able to withstand days that are cloudy, days that are stormy. So what are some of the things we're doing in this phase? Um, We woke up one day and realized that every neighborhood was now mixed use. Uh, at, at, At the new urbanism, we have talked for decades about the need for real neighborhoods, real places, and real places being not monocultures of, you know, R1 zoning here and R2 zoning here and never shall the two touch or meet in any way. And then we'll have our commercial over here and our office space over there. Um, you know, read your suburban nation. It's like the, one of the founding uh, rejections of the new urbanist approach. Um, we woke up and all of a sudden our dreams have been realized. In front of us, every neighborhood is now a mixed use neighborhood. Um, everybody's working from home. Uh, there's no chaos or mayhem breaking out. You know, people aren't rioting. Well, not over home occupations. Uh, people are and people, you know, aren't burning down houses because their neighbors now, you know, teaching piano lessons from home or working, you know, uh, internet company or what have you. Um, and so let's take this opportunity to legalize that. Um, let's waive those home occupation restrictions. Let's just get rid of them. Let's just say this is, this is not an issue. This is not a deal. You know, we're ignoring them anyway. Let's just get rid of them. Let's take that opportunity to make that step. Um, let's go the next step then and legalize our essential neighborhood services. Um, one of the things that we found in this pandemic is that places that had neighborhood services uh, were better suited uh, in terms of uh, Trans, lower vectors of transmission uh, than places that did not. Um, th- think this through for a sec. If, if you have a neighborhood grocery store and you're getting a delivery into that neighborhood grocery store and then people from the neighborhood are able to go there, um, that is a much different vector for transmission of the virus than everybody in the community having to drive out to one grocery store or one you know, big box department store or hardware store in order to get your essentials. That becomes a huge vector for transmission. And so we can do something really bold here and say, we're going to not only waive these home occupations, but we're gonna allow this uh, neighborhood services to come in. We're gonna allow people to cut hair. We're gonna allow people to have uh, a little bodega. We're gonna allow people to do things that serve the needs of people within the neighborhood. We're gonna make that legal. There's no reason it should have been illegal in the first place. we need to uh, focus on kickstarting entrepreneurs. Um, there's a distinction here that's important to make between an entrepreneur and an investor. An entrepreneur uh, is a crazy person who doesn't know they can fail. Uh, an investor is someone who has lots of capital and is putting money into something that they don't believe will fail. Um, or if they have a, a huge amount of money, are putting a small portion of that into something that they are taking a reasonable gamble on. Those are, those are two different types of people. We're going to be fine with investors. We are bailing out investors. We're pumping money into systems to support investors. 
we got, you know, on a macroeconomic level, we've got investors back. Don't worry about them. What we need at the local level as part of this economic ecosystem, this place that is fragile and struggling that we depend on and need is entrepreneurs. We need crazy people who don't know they can fail. People who have a dream and an idea to be of use to their neighbors that they just want to try out. These people we need to cultivate and now more than ever because there's a lot of them that have been sidelined because they've lost their job, they've lost their opportunity, they've had their hours reduced and we can tap into that energy now and use it to propel our local communities. Um, this image right here on the screen is from Muskegon, Michigan. Uh, Muskegon uh, experienced rapid deindustrialization uh, in the last century. They lost tens of thousands of people in a very short period of time. Their downtown uh, was uh, not completely empty, but had a lot of vacancies in it. And what they found was that a lot of the people, the entrepreneurs who would like to fill those spaces uh, couldn't meet the bar. They couldn't afford the sprinkler system. They couldn't afford the ADA bathroom. They couldn't afford the long-term lease. The space was too big for what they needed. So what Muskegon did is they went out, they took an empty lot, they closed the gap in the streetscape by putting in these storage sheds. You can see they painted them up kind of funky and they rent them out to start up entrepreneurs at, at ridiculously cheap rates, 75, 80 bucks a month, something, something very low. Now you have these full of these crazy people with their ideas, trying to be of service to people in the community. Can I do something here that I can make a profit doing that? I can make a living uh, that my neighbors, you know, will pay me for. And what Muskegon has found is by lowering this bar to entry, they gave people the confidence to be able to go start a business, to change, to adapt, to figure out what worked, what didn't work when the stakes were very low. And now today, if you go to Muskegon, their entire downtown is full. And a lot of the businesses that occupy those storefronts are people who essentially graduated out of this startup. When we lower the bar of entry, uh, we make room for more people to be part of our game, be part of our system. Um, we need to legalize housing adaptations. Uh, the, I mentioned earlier the foreclosure crisis, the pending foreclosure crisis. There's a lot of people who are about to be kicked out of their homes. Uh, if we look back historically at the way people have dealt with hardship, people have dealt with hardship in terms of housing by uh, splitting up their houses, by inviting people in, by converting to a bed and breakfast. Um, there are many, many stories, fictional and non uh, from, you know, times pre-Great Depression, uh, even during the Great Depression, when this was an accepted practice, uh, where people would, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the breadwinner in the, the house dies, uh, the people who are left can't afford the home, uh, they turn one of the rooms, or two of the rooms into a bed and breakfast, uh, they put a little sign out front, people stay the night, they give them a little bit of food and send them on their way in the morning, and they use that money to make ends meet. We have stripped our uh, families. We have stripped our households from being able to do this for no good reason. Uh, we have people who desperately need homes. We have people who desperately need cash flow to stay in their homes. The idea that we could marry those two in real time and provide answers to people and flexibility is something that is reasonable and logical that we should be doing immediately. Um, we make quick and lean investments in biking and walking. And I think everybody probably on this call understands what this is. Uh, the idea that we have all this space that we have devoted to vehicles uh, is ridiculous in good times. Now, when we look at the, the, the vastness and the emptiness and the underutilization of all this, it, it's a time to step in and fill that void. Create that space for people to bike, create that space for people to walk. It's good for public health. It's good for transportation. And I'm just going to throw in a little pitch at the end of this. If, if we are legalizing neighborhood services, if we're waiving home occupations, if we're kickstarting entrepreneurs and legalizing housing adaptation, the, the one thing that you can do right now to get capital to stay in your community to free up people and give them options is to allow them to live in a place where they can go from two cars to one. Uh, or in a household, or from one car to none. When you can have a family that can go from two cars to one, you're saving them seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a year. That's uh, over a hundred thousand dollars of mortgage that they can now afford because they don't have that burden of an automobile. We can make huge changes in the economy of our places when we make it easy to walk and bike. Um, 
along those lines, we need to end our parking requirements. I mean, I, 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 I debated putting this in or not because it's like, are we just piling on at this point? I mean, this is something you should have done uh, you know, before the pandemic. Um, but again, the idea of looking at this vast underutilized space, recognizing that we could use these storage shed pop-up uh, businesses. We could use investment in our community. Parking is an anti-investment. It's an anti-place. It is an anti-tax base. It, you know, it's an anti-jobs uh, use of property. So the more parking we have, the more we are financially going backward. If we want to make our places stable, we should not be putting this burden on, on either our businesses or on people who want to make better use use of their housing. Um, start growing food is one of these ways that we can become more self-sufficient. It's actually the starter strategy. It's the easiest way. When we can create a culture of locally grown food, uh, we find that not only uh, can we jumpstart a lot of entrepreneurism, not only can we jumpstart a lot of community togetherness uh, and, and cooperative action, but we actually eat better and are healthier at the end of the day. Um, we need to thicken our civic infrastructure. At, at, at the local level, we often look at government as one thing and then kind of the civic realm as another so we have the local government then we have the churches and the synagogues and the mosques and then we have uh the rotary club and the lions club and then we have you know the youth group and we have all these these things and and they're 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 disaggregated from each other they're they're pushing on different things they're working in different ways there have been some really good studies. And I, I think one of the ones that's probably the friendliest to read is a book called Alienated America by Tim Carney. Uh, Tim Carney actually studied uh, red districts, so Republican districts, in the 2016 primary and how they voted. Did they vote for Donald Trump? Did they vote for a different candidate in the, in the, on the docket on the Republican side? And what he found is that the places that had the thickest civic infrastructure had the most sense of community, the most sense of place, uh, the most sense of, of togetherness and working collaboratively, uh, both in government and outside government and throughout the, the, uh, the community, uh, tended to not vote for Donald Trump. They tended to be less desperate, uh, to have more of kind of a built-in safety net for people. And uh, were not, in a sense, uh, captive by Donald Trump's uh, presidential campaign. The places that were more desperate, the places that lacked not necessarily the economic opportunity, uh, but lacked that thick civic infrastructure, uh, where the individuals within that city were more isolated from each other, uh, those places tended to vote for uh, the current president. Um, this is not a statement on politics or a statement on the current president, um, but is a statement on the communities that we're building, the places that we're building, and what makes them successful and viable over the long run. Uh, we should not be afraid of taking proactive steps to thicken that civic infrastructure and make these you know, institutions outside of government an important part of how we build our communities. Um, along those lines, uh, begin reorienting bureaucracies. This, this gets back to that idea of uh, uh, of orienting vertically versus horizontally, uh, a, a lot of our bureaucracies just, you know, and, and I don't say that as a pejorative word. I know often bureaucrats or bureaucracies are thrown around as pejoratives. Uh, the systems of governance that we have internal to our cities, most often those are oriented around the capital flows that we've historically experienced post-World War II. They're oriented vertically. What is the money we can get from Wall Street? Uh, to do a development project? What is the money that we can get from the bond market to do some type of project? What is the state or federal program that we can tap into to get some money to do a project? These are capital flows. And if you spend any appreciable amount of time in a city hall, you will see that uh, the agendas, the internal conversations, uh, the, the organizational chart, um, they're all oriented in a way to, in a sense, capture these capital flows coming into the community. Um, what we have found is not only the most successful strategy for building, building a prosperous place, but also the most successful financial strategy for a community is to stop orienting vertically and start orienting horizontally. Uh, what we like to talk about is focusing on the urgent needs of people within the community. We've developed a, a four-step approach to capital investments. 
uh, if you actually type in Google Strong Towns four-step approach, you will get that. It's very simple. But the idea is to make uh, strategic investments that address the urgent needs of people in our communities. We need to uh, reorient our bureaucracies so that we are in touch with those urgent needs as opposed to focusing on those vertical capital flows. And then finally, uh, we need to change how we measure success. Uh, Pensacola, Florida, which may be on this uh, call right now, that would be incredible. Uh, I'm very fond of, they were our 2019 Strongest Town of the Year award winner. Uh, one of the things that Pensacola has done, and it wasn't the government, it was a, a civic organization. And this is why civic infrastructure is so important. Um, they said, we're measuring all the wrong things. It doesn't really matter to the success of our community how many building permits we issued or how much traffic we had in a certain year. Um, what really matters to community are things like, uh, you know, are our kids graduating from high school? Um, are our, you know, children ready to learn when they get to kindergarten? Um, are, you know, what is our public health response? They, so they created a website where they started measuring and tracking community metrics, trying to make a different set of understanding, one that is not based on merely transactions, like number of permits or number of vehicles, uh, you know, vehicle miles traveled, that type of thing, just pure transactions, but something that is more qualitative, that actually speaks to quality of life and, and, and true prosperity. Um, that link is in the toolkit. You can get that uh, when you download the toolkit. In this section, I want to talk about this, which is, is kind of funny today. Not funny, haha, -ha, but funny with some deep irony. One of the things that it looked like at the beginning of this whole pandemic is that there was going to be a major infrastructure bill. Um, as we are, you know, as we want to do from time to time, uh, when we meet a crisis, uh, we like to throw money at it. And the way you throw money at it is to use existing uh, systems that are set up to, uh, to channel that money through to places, you know, where you want it to go. Um, we saw this back in 2008, 2009, the housing crisis, uh, the concept of shovel-ready projects became a thing that we all became familiar with. A shovel-ready project is merely a project that was uh, birthed within the community in some way, uh, generally with the staff. Uh, it was brought through the entire project development process. When it got to the end where people actually had to pay something for it, we had to make a decision and weigh it against other projects. It was decided that that project wasn't worthy of our time and energy and resources. Uh, and so it was put on a shelf. Uh, awaiting the day when money came, you know, flowing through the, the sluices down to our community where we could take that off the shelf and do this project that we didn't find viable in the first place. Um, this is a, a horrible way to receive federal assistance. And this is a horrible way to receive federal money. Um, we wrote a, uh, in my book, uh, Strong Towns, it's actually say back here, Bottom Up Revolution to Rebuild American Prosperity. Uh, I went through with my good friend, Joe Minicozzi uh, from Urban 3 and, and looked at the, kind of the characteristics of neighborhoods that were good investments. Um, this is not a, a universal truth. Obviously, there are, are, are many different things going on in many different places. Um, but if you're shotgunning something from Washington, D.C., if you're just pouring money down and, and saying, you know, here's the kind of things we should do. Uh, there are certain places where you're more likely to get positive results than negative results. The same thing goes for us at the community level. If we're going to be inundated with money, if we're just going to have money thrown at us and it said, you have to use this for an infrastructure project, instead of pulling that bad project off the shelf, instead of asking your engineer, what's, what's the thing that you've always wanted to do that now you've got money to do? Um, if we just prioritize in a basic sense, I'm not saying we're always going to get it right, and I'm not saying these are always the best projects, but if we're spitballing it, this is, this is going to be better than anything else we're going to do. First, prioritize maintenance over new capacity. Use this money that you're going to be gifted uh, and think of it as like one time, never going to happen again, which it very well might be. Uh, use it to fix something. Use it to take care of something that you've already promised you'll fix. And it says, uh, cross off one of your liabilities off your balance sheet. Prioritize things that are below ground versus above ground. 
Uh, if you can go in and fix a half mile of underground pipe, that pipe's going to be there for three generations. It's going to be brand new. It's going to help you. It's going to, it's, it's going to be way, it's going to be a way better long-term investment than anything you could do above ground. We like to get paving contractors working. We like to get sidewalk construction work. I, I get it. That's, that's a macro objective, uh, you know, that comes through our lobbying systems and what have you. If you get the option, fix something underground. Uh, that's going to have way longer returns. If you have the alternative to prioritize where that work is done, prioritize neighborhoods that are more than 75 years old. And I say that because when we look at neighborhoods, when we study their financial uh, characteristics, when we look at their overall productivity, neighborhoods that are set more than 75 years old tend to, on a whole, be far more financially productive, pay a far higher return on investment, are actually in many places uh, financially positive, where developments that are younger than 75 years old tend to go in the other direction. You also have in neighborhoods that are more than 75 years old, uh, generally, a platform for building that is flexible and adaptable and can change over time. So these are neighborhoods where you're putting money in to fix things, hopefully below ground, where you can expect that there will be uh, potential for responding to uh, positive feedback loops. If you go out to neighborhoods that are less than 75 years old, they are designed to be more static. Uh, they are designed not to adapt and change. And so the expectation that an investment would fuel some type of elevation of tax base, elevation of property values, some type of further levels of productivity is just not there. So if you can meet these three things, again, I'm not suggesting that any project that doesn't meet these things is automatically a bad project, but if you've got to decide in a short period of time, where are we going to spend our money? If you just use these three rules of thumb, you're going to be better off than not. So, in the last few minutes I've got left, we're going to focus on what comes a, a year and beyond. And this is really like core strong towns thinking. Uh, we need to uh, rely on little bets, not on transformational projects. We've, we've done decades and decades of transformational projects. We're done with that. Um, let's go back now and make better use of the stuff we've already built, filling in those gaps, uh, thickening up our places. We need to emphasize resiliency, not simple efficiency. Our model today of building cities has largely been a production-based model. How do we do this efficiently over and over and over? And because of that, we've lost that resiliency. We need to go back and say, how do we build places that are resilient? Places that are designed to adapt to feedback. Places that can change, can adapt, can become different and evolve over time. He, you know, human habitat is a complex environment. When we make things static, when we put them under glass and we don't allow them to adapt to feedback, um, that's where we get failure. Um, we need to take our cues from bottom-up action, not top-down systems. Again, going back to this idea of orienting ourselves horizontally, responding to the urgent needs of our communities, as opposed to orienting ourselves vertically so we can receive those capital flows from these uh, you know, top-down systems. We need to conduct as much of life as possible at a personal scale. When, when we are building human habitat, when we are building cities, uh, the human, the person, becomes the indicator species of success. Where we see people out in the environment, what we're seeing is environments that are financially productive and successful. And so when we can scale our investments and we can scale our places to work for humans outside of an automobile, uh, we are financially putting ourselves in a better position. And we will know that by doing the math. We obsessively... Uh, start to calculate things that we have long overlooked and taken for granted. So how do we do these things? Um, focus on your downtown and an ecosystem of neighborhoods. And it's important that those two things be merged together. A downtown uh, that's a museum piece where we drive to it and we park and then we get down and walk around and then we drive back out. Um, you know, you've got that. It's called Disney World, you know, and it's very nice and I like it and I enjoy it. Um, but it's not a community. It's not a place. Um, for a neighborhood to work or for a downtown to work, it needs to be part of a neighborhood. And that neighborhood and downtown form an ecosystem that play off each other. Uh, we need to focus on that uh, relationship between the two. Um, from, a, from a zoning standpoint, and I think everybody again on this call knows and understands this, instead of neighborhood compatibility, I mean, sorry, instead of use, simple use, 
We need to focus on neighborhood compatibility. How are we constructing our neighborhoods so that the buildings interact with each other in a positive way, so that they form a place, a place people want to be in outside of their vehicles? Uh, I don't really care if you're building uh, a place for an electrician or a place for a plumber. I care about whether that place is a good neighbor or not. Um, focus on expanding housing opportunities. We can start with the things we did in the second phase and build on them, legalizing the next increment of intensity everywhere at all times. If you have a neighborhood of single family homes, there should be zero obstacle to that neighborhood transforming over the next decade or two into a neighborhood of duplexes. There just should be no obstacle to that happening. Uh, every neighborhood should be able to expand in these ways. Um, focus on transportation as a means, not to an end. Uh, this is an obsession of mine. I actually have a book I'm working on right now that will be coming out next year that deals primarily with transportation. Um, so much of what we do in our communities is based on transportation because transfer, transportation is the place where we can access in this vertical orientation, the most capital coming into our communities. So we can build places, we can make investments that, that are auto oriented because that's where we're getting the money to do. It's one of these things where, you know, when, when, when you have a hammer, every project becomes a nail. When you have uh, transportation money coming in, every project becomes a transportation project. We need to flip that around and say, what is going on in this place and how does our transportation investment serve that as opposed to the other way around? Focus on economic gardening with uh, economic development with a gardening mentality. Um, the idea of hunting versus gardening uh, was a profound one in terms of human evolution. Uh, the idea that one person could go out and find food for themselves and a couple others and repeat that day after day after day uh, is very limiting. Uh, the idea that one person could grow food that could feed dozens of people be freed up to do other productive things was absolutely transformative. Uh, in our local communities, we need to be thinking about not how do we attract that one business to create 50 jobs, but how do we take 50 businesses we already have and create an environment where they grow one job a piece. It's the same number of jobs. It's the same amount of employment. One is very fragile and costs us a lot of money. The other one is very stable and benefits the people that are living in our communities today. Um, focusing on leveraging our public spaces, the idea uh, our parks should radiate wealth and radiate value and become places not that we drive to to consume, uh, like a store or like a you know customer transaction, but places that actually are embedded within our communities. So they provide deep wealth and value to the neighborhoods around them. Um, focus on our people. Uh, you know this this could have been the first thing. Uh, it certainly is very core to strong towns. This idea of focusing on the urgent needs of people and having that be the driving force for what is and then the next thing we do is and then the next thing and then reduce our debts and liabilities understand uh it has become very fashionable to take on debt and liabilities as a way to achieve growth but when you take on at the local level a debt or a liability what you are doing is you are giving up options you're giving up flexibility in the future and we can see right now that what our cities see more than anything is a lot of flexibility and so by reducing our debts by reducing our liabilities uh we are buying the capacity to respond to hardship. Uh, we have a site called the Strong Towns Community. This is a place where people from around the world are going to try to have conversations about how they do these things in their local community. You can access that at community.strongtowns.org. Uh, in the very early days of the pandemic, in response to uh, all these inquiries we had, we set up something called the Strong Towns Academy. You can get that at academy.strongtowns.org. Um, we put a free Strong Towns 101 course in there. The course is designed to give you a broad overview of Strong Towns thoughts and ideas. Uh, we find it very useful for sharing with people. So if you are on board, but you wanna get your council member or your neighbor or a, a prominent business owner or you know whoever it is that you're trying to influence, uh, it's one of those things where we've made the course very easy to go through, very accessible, uh, and we have made it for free. So you can refer people to that and then have a dialogue and a conversation about how you do this stuff in your community. For those of you that want to go deeper, uh, we have been developing and we are in the process of developing uh, eight different courses. You can think of these as how-to courses where we walk you through how to build a plan for your place. Uh, I'm uh, about two thirds of the way through right now. The first one here, aligning transportation with a strong town's approach. We started releasing housing opportunity courses 
in the last week, and you'll see those now regularly from this point forward. Uh, the rest of these are due to be out uh, by, uh, by sometime next year. Uh, if you're interested in those, again, those are at academy.strongtowns.org. And then finally, uh, you can get all of our Strong Towns content, all of our stuff at strongtowns.org. We publish two, three articles a day. Like I said, we've got uh, a bunch of different podcast streams, uh, a lot of video, and, and a huge, huge archive. And if you're interested in this specific toolkit, uh, you can get that. We'll email it to you if you go to strongtowns.org slash toolkit and sign up. So I am going to stop there. Look at that. It said finish at an hour. I finished at an hour exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One time I was giving a talk at, um, at I'll, I'll let people start to get their questions in. Uh, I'll tell you this story because it's a Florida story. I got invited to come speak at uh, the Lifelong Learning Network, and they were actually having their conference at uh, the Disney, I think it was the Disney Dolphin Hotel. And so they invited me to come speak there. And it was during the winter, so as a Minnesotan, if I get invited to speak in Florida in the winter, it's an automatic yes, like I will make this happen. Um, they wanted me to speak for 50 minutes and the guy was really uptight about this. And he said, I do not want you to speak for 49 minutes. I do not want you to speak for 51 minutes. I want you to speak for 50 minutes. And if you are still on the stage at 51 minutes, we will come and pull you off. But we want you there for 50 minutes. And they were very like schedule oriented. Um, I went up, I found out, when I started, I had no watch. And I was, I started to kind of get a little bit nervous because I had a talk and I thought it would be roughly 50 minutes, but you know, you never really know for sure. And uh, I, I, I did my talk, I finished up, uh, I, uh, I uh, walked off the stage and he met me and he's like, that was so impressive. It was 50 minutes exactly. So I felt, well, that's, that's a professional right there. <laughs> I earned my I earned my keep on that one. So, Laura, are you uh, going to help out with questions, or you want uh, that would be wonderful if you would. Yeah, I'd appreciate the opportunity. And while they're coming in, I'll go ahead and start us off. Um, I was reading over the local leaders toolkit before this presentation, and you were right. The connecting masks to economic recovery recovery was the first thing I jotted down that I yeah. wanted to follow on. <laughs> and our first comment from the group here was that spot on. Are there any good examples or campaigns that have successfully made that connection? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know as I've seen any campaigns, um, but what I have seen and what we have, we, we've done a couple of profiles on Strong Towns of local leaders who have done this. Um, you know, local leaders who wear their mask, um, but not only wear their mask prominently, but then talk about why. And they're talking about it, and, and, and I think this is what separates to me like the ones who are most effective versus the ones that struggle. Um, they never shame. Uh, they, they, they never you know, scold people. They never say, you're gonna kill grandma if you don't wear a mask. They, they, they don't do any of those things. What they say is that, I want you to know that I'm wearing a mask right now. And I'm wearing a mask because I care about our city. I wanna get people back to work. I wanna get us up on our feet. I don't want us to fall apart. And, 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 and regardless of anything else, this is the quickest, easiest way for us to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good examples of, of local leaders doing that. There's a, uh, if, if you go and look at, follow me on Twitter, I don't follow all that many people. Um, there's a woman that I follow, her first name is Arliss and I can't think of her name, her, her city, she's a city council member in California. Her name is Arliss, and I, I, that, that's the only thing that comes to my mind, but she is a, a, a leader to follow and a leader to watch because she is one of these like lead by examples, let's talk about it this way. She has strong opinions on mass and public health, but they're not part of the way she talks about it. She talks about it in terms of her community, her constituents, her place and getting it all moving forward. Um, so if you want like a living, breathing example, in your Twitter feed, follow her. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll do. It sounds like a different way to frame the issue, something very reasonable and make that connection. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like so many times we are drawn into 
um, because we live in this highly connected world, we're drawn into these global conversations. I'm not even suggesting that those aren't important, um, but oftentimes they're not helpful when you're trying to do things at the local level, when you're trying to do things together with people. Because mm -hmm. if we want to accomplish something in our cities, we have to work with people that we, you know, not only politically disagree with, but probably have like a longstanding family feud with, you know, about <laughs> something that happened a decade ago, or they, you know, don't, weren't nice to this person or that. And if, if you're gonna be an effective local leader, you've got to get beyond not only the politics, but like the pettiness, like you got to be the bigger person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Chuck, I have another question for you. It's Please. from the Tallahassee Downtown Improvement Authority CEO, Elizabeth. She wants to know, well, first she says, Chuck, this has been so informative. Thank you. Um, she wants to know if you have suggestions for how to advocate for leveraging public spaces at a time when many governments are restricting the use of those public spaces because of the pandemic. Right. Um, that's a, I feel like that question could go in two ways. Um, let's look at it the, the, the short-term way. Um, we saw a lot of examples of uh, cities, particularly I think the, the bigger cities early on in the pandemic, when it was, I'm gonna say this and, and, and don't read too much into this, when it was very scary, um, you know, because the early days of this pandemic, when you had people who couldn't get into hospitals in New York City, um, you know, and you're like, okay, this is where this happens here. It was very, very scary. Um, I think it's a little less scary now, not only because we've learned some of the, some better ways to treat things, but we also, you know, have a handle on, on some of the ways to prevent transmission. But the early days were very, very scary. And you saw people reacting to that scariness by becoming very authoritarian in terms of people meeting, uh, shutting down parks, having police out there patrolling parks. Um, I saw this, this horrific video, horrific. This is my like park lovingness coming in. I saw this video that was very uh, startling where in California they were going in and taking sand and filling in skate parks because they didn't want people out skating. So they were basically like wrecking their parks um, I suppose you could dig that all back out again, but it would not be easy to do. Uh, this stuff was all, I think, very counterproductive. The places that did the best job with this were the ones that uh, would use signs and say, hey, like, we all want to be safe here. Uh, you know, please social distance. And then would augment that with essentially like a public message and a public presence by their law enforcement there, you know, I, 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 I'm going to say this, and I, I, I don't mean this in a, in, a, in a pejorative way, but the spare capacity they had at City Hall, there were a lot of people at City Hall who had urgent jobs that were doing work, and then all of a sudden one day, uh, you know, that job was not needed, um, or not the, the thing that was most needed, and so repurposing some of those people to go out and just meet with people and say, hey, um, this is why we need you to, to distance, this is why we need you to to space out. Um, and then I did see some places where they would put, you know, <laughs> very much like the Disney parks, I'll go back to this example again, have put like limits on the number of people that can come in. And they're very, they're a lot lower than what the regular capacity is. They've said like, this park has reached capacity. Like you can't come into it anymore. You, you've, you, we're not allowing more people in and would get even volunteers to sit and help with that in some places. Most of our cities won't reach that, won't have that. Mm -hmm. um, that I'll go back to what I said earlier. I, I don't think we will have uh, a police presence that will effectively do this. I think what we have to do is open things up and then envelop that opening up with uh, a, a narrative of here's how we get our community going. You care about jobs, you care about the health of this community, you care about, you know, if your care is just you to go up or if your care is like i care about the health of it whatever it is here's how we do that stay apart and you know I, I, i'm going to just briefly talk long term about that and there's an anecdote that we like to say at strong towns if you are building your park with a parking lot you're doing it wrong um 
you're doing it wrong. Parks should, like a, like a furnace radiates heat or an air conditioner radiates cool. Uh, a park should radiate wealth to the surrounding neighborhoods. And if your idea of a park is something that's, that, that is shut off from everything around it, that you access by a vehicle, you, you're, you're not capitalizing and leveraging that park investment the way that you should be. And so I, I think as we're going through this transition and we're thinking about these spaces, one of the things that we should do is be cognizant of how people get from their homes and their work and, and, and other things to parks and make sure that those are, uh, you know, not requiring you to get in a car and drive, but are actually positioned where that wealth is generated to the surrounding neighborhoods. I hope that answered the question. I think so. On a related note, I want to follow up about making the connection between community leaders, planners, to those leaders in the community that actually set the policy and make decisions. As you are going over the midterm responses, those seem like very progressive, reasonable planning approaches, like allowing home occupations, opening up essential services in your neighborhoods. Is there an opportunity here to leverage those planning approaches to leverage the current moment to get policymakers to be on board with those new ways of doing things? Yeah, I, I hope so. I, we're all amongst friends here. So, uh, you know, we're all, we're all new urbanists and, and, and we all, uh, you know, I think share a lot of the same common goals. Um, the first time I heard the phrase, and I think it was borrowed from somewhere else, was Rahm Emanuel, who said, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think he was referring to other things. Uh, when you look at this, there's a certain amount of, I will confess, opportunism. I, I think that opportunism aligns with what is actually called for and urgent right now. And I, I tried to make that case in the presentation that, you know, legalizing home occupations is, a, is an urgent thing we should do right now. I mean, the idea that, that we would somehow be out enforcing home occupation licenses on literally you know, half our population now that's working from home is, is kind of silly. Well, it is silly. And, and pointing that out is an opportunity to get rid of them once and for all. Um, legalizing neighborhood commercial, okay? Uh, there are some really good urgent public health reasons why this makes sense. There's some really good urgent uh, you know, economic development reasons why this makes sense. There's some really good urgent job creation reasons why this makes sense. So if we just focus on the urgency of right now, there's some really good reasons to do all these things. They're also really good long-term things. And so I, I, I do think that the pandemic presents an opportunity, not for us to, and I'm, I'm going to, I'll give a really bad analogy. I'll give an analogy that could offend some people. When I say this, I always like am doubting my mind, like, should I say this or not? So if we go back to September 11, 2001, uh, what came out of that was the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was something that uh, people have been trying to get passed for years, certain parts of it, certain parts of it, certain parts of it. And all of a sudden, uh, the, the September 11th attacks became like this vehicle to get something done that you wanted done all along. You can think what you want about the Patriot Act, good, bad. Um, what I'm suggesting is that what we want to see happen as a group, as new urbanists, is going to help people, help our communities, make our communities stronger, better, more resilient. This pandemic is a vehicle to do some of those things, particularly the ones that address the like urgent thing that needs to be done right now. And, and, and that's why I think we should, you know, go forth with all earnestness to get these things done. Well, let me jump to the next question to make sure I fit it in here. It's from Victor Dover, and he asked, Chuck, you've made many trips to Florida, and we need help seeing ourselves. What's the one thing you've seen over and over that's uniquely Florida, that when you see it, you say, yep, that's Florida again, good or um, bad or both, either which way? Well, first of all, Florida is blessed to have Victor Dover, um, one of the, uh, you know, one of a, 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 a person who... Um, and I'll say this, my early days of figuring out what Strong Towns was going to be uh, and having a lot of self-doubt over, am I really quitting 
my engineering and planning practice to write a blog? Like, is this, is this even a sane thing to do? Um, pulled me aside. And as a person who was, uh, you know, uh, someone I admired from afar, pulled me aside and said, you keep going, like do this. And, and that made a huge difference in my life. Um, I, I will give you the, the good and the bad. I, I think from a good standpoint, um, Florida has uh, a, 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 a culture um, and, and really the opportunity based on the, the, the weather and the architecture and a kind of a, a whole bunch of unique things coming together uh, to build some quite fantastic downtowns. And I think, you know, uh, some of them obviously can be a bit touristy, um, but touristy is not a bad transition to something else. I mean, I, I think a lot of those places where we're building them with touristy kind of thoughts in mind, uh, could someday, if that's not the most urgent need, be repurposed and be repurposed beautifully to things that are more neighborhood focused. And so I think from an architecture and a design standpoint, uh, some of the best new downtowns or new places uh, you're going to find in the nation, you're going to find in Florida. Um, on the other side of the equation, uh, we call Florida, Strong Towns does, uh, the Strode capital of North America. Um, Strode is a term that we invented. Strode is a street road hybrid. Uh, we call this the futon of transportation. Uh, a Strode is not a place where you're driving slow enough to actually have a place, um, but you're not driving fast enough to actually get somewhere. And it seems like uh, half of the transportation infrastructure you have in Florida uh, is, is a Strode, are Strodes. Um, it's the only place I've been where I got on a toll road and then was subjected to uh, traffic signals where I had to stop. Uh, I'm like, what, what kind of insanity is this? Um, the idea that you, uh, you know, in Florida, I think have perfected the six lane divided strode where every half mile you have another iteration of Publix, uh, Taco Bell, uh, strip mall with t-shirts and you just have that going indefinitely radiating out from your, so many of your cities um, is a bizarre feature that I hope, uh, you know, starts to, st starts to become so passe that you just are not building them anymore. Ooh. Okay. Well, let's highlight the good stuff again. So back to the <laughs> towns um, based somewhat on tourism that have opportunities to adapt in the future. Um, as a follow-up, Victor asked about the Muskegon example, yeah. um, and he asked, where can we read more about those details? Um, we did a whole write-up on it a couple times, because Muskegon, so Pensacola was our 2019 strongest town of the year. Muskegon was our 2018 strongest town of the year. Um, so we did some write-ups on them uh, while that contest was going on, and then Afterward, we, I, I went there, did a talk, and we did a bunch of write-ups and interviews with them about that particular project. So if, if you type in Google Strongtown Muskegon, you will get a couple case studies. And uh, Victor, in particular, if you are interested, I would be more than happy to introduce you to their planner and, um, and their mayor because they're fantastic people and uh, would, would, would love an interaction with you. Um, Chuck, I think we have time. I can ask you a little bit about Florida's application of context classifications. Uh, CNU did a workshop last week where they went into a specific examples and Amanda would like to know um, more of your thoughts on the intersection of community level planning with transportation projects, especially in the framework of today's conversation. So I said that I'm, I'm writing a book. Uh, about transportation. It, it's, it's called Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. And it, uh, it's actually due in 10 days, but it won't be done then. But uh, it, it will still come out next year. It's very close to being done. Um, one of the laments in that book, and I, lament is the wrong word. One, one of the observations in that book, and, and that turns into an actionable uh, recommendation, is that when we do community development through transportation projects. Um, what we do is we create uh, the, the wrong center of gravity or the wrong uh, power framework for having these conversations. When you give, uh, when, when you have a million dollar street project that you're doing 
And it's the engineering department that has that street project or the public works department or however you, you configure your city. And part of that uh, process then is collaborative for the engineer then to take the project and go around to all the departments and get uh, feedback and go to the public and get feedback and you know do, do their best to engage everybody. What you have is you have a project that starts as a transportation project. That's like its essential foundation and base and then proceeds through this process with that as like its grounding feature. And so all of the embedded values, all the embedded hierarchies, all of the priorities of a transportation system become paramount and everything else, it becomes subservient to that. And if there's going to be any shift in that is a fight or a battle you know, oh, we won uh, a third lane instead of four lanes. Oh, we won a little bit of extra sidewalk or we won this. From a design process, this is backward and it's centering power in the wrong place. What, what I'm recommending in the book and what we talk about in the transportation course we've done for the Strong Towns Academy is that we need to create uh, basically design teams. And, and I go so far as to say, runs the team should be a non-technical person. In other words, someone with no technical expertise. They don't know what the proper sidewalk width should be, how deep the asphalt pavement should be constructed. They don't know any of that. What they know is basically like facilitating or community conversation. They know how to ask questions to figure out what priorities are. And the way those processes should start is by actually going out and, and doing some humble ops of determining where people in the community are struggling to utilize this space. Now, the transportation money can be of service to the community, not the community in service to the, the money. Now the project can actually serve the needs of people uh, and, and the space and the building and all the things that we're trying to accomplish can come to this table on somewhat even footing. And then at the end of the day, we turn, a transporta we, we turn it into a transportation project. This grounds it in a different place. And, and, and I would highly recommend that people not be afraid uh, to step out of the silo and hierarchy paradigm that we're used to at City Hall and actually create these uh, non-technical led project teams as a way to get to this context sensitive kind of design we want to be at. Mm -hmm. Um, Chuck, it looks like we have a comment or question from Andres Duani. Let's see if he's... You're joking um, me. No. <laughs> no. How are you? Hey, um, a, um, just to actually just follow up and confirm something you said, which is that every team should have somebody who's not a specialist. Um, I actually would go one step further and say that all the specialists could speak about absolutely anything except their specialty. <laughs> Because the minute somebody says, I'm a traffic engineer and this is the way it is, or I'm a fire marshal and this is the way it is, or I'm a retail expert, that's the way it is, it shuts down conversation, or at least it begins to shut down conversation. Once they're not allowed to speak about their specialty, they're actually underneath it all a human, you know, and it's a human who's a father or a son or, a, or who has to drive the roads, who, you know, who has to spend time in traffic or who likes to walk, and suddenly they become very intelligent. Uh, it's, the, it's the specialty that makes you stupid. And of course, they should be available on the side for whispered conversation and advice, but they should never present as a specialist. It, it, it's, a, it's an amazing day in my life when I get a question from Victor Dover and then one from Andres. Um, let me follow up what Andres just said with uh, an insight that I learned from him. Uh, he spoke once to a, a group I was in about juries and about a process they use in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I actually think what we're talking about here uh, when, you know, and I completely agree, don't talk about your specialty. What we're trying to do is, is get this down to a human level. I, I, I think also the idea of including people our vested interest in the building on the corner or, you know, the development of this lot tends to also not yield optimal outcomes. And so I really am fond of the idea of using citizen juries, basically people 
picked at random from the community mm -hmm. to come in and represent the community itself mm -hmm. in a way that is not a vested interest in a, in a specific plot or a specific outcome, but a vested interest in the community as a whole. Yeah. And, and if we could do public engagement in that way, I think we could augment this, you know, very flat design process with something that would, would, would get us a lot farther with community buy-in as well. We, we need to uh, address the, the public process and its inefficiencies and very high, uh, the, the, the skills that it requires, it virtually requires a Victor Dover to have a successful charrette these days, you know? And uh, that expertise is hard to get. And I do think we need to question the charrette and it is no answer to say, it's got to be bottom up or we've got to just listen that's not enough for a new urbanist. You know, that's enough for a political statement, but it's not enough. And I think the, the opening up that discussion to see how do we make a more efficient charrette that's more dependable, you know, and its outcome is more dependable instead of, an, or, instead of a disappointment as it so often is, I think that's really something that should be top on the agenda. And really it's not enough, I, I emphasize to say, we gotta listen better or it's gotta be bottom up. We could have said that 30 years ago, you know? Um, so what you just begin to, make, to talk about is having the non-specialist and giving the non-specialist standing is very important. Another concept that I heard Andre speak about years ago that, that resonated with me, and it, it largely resonated with me because of my, my Catholic upbringing, um, where this is a common practice, is the idea of subsidiarity. And subsidiary is often described as, you know, the lowest level that can competently make the decision right. is allowed to make the decision. But subsidiary is actually a, a step further, which is the lowest level that's competent to make the decision should like must make the decision. Mm -hmm. And any decision that you can't make at that level should be up. And in fact, I think I quoted you in my book, Andres, on, on subsidiary and the chicken problem. You know, the idea that, uh, we, we let regional councils decide whether you can have neighborhood chickens when that's really like a block level decision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we allow blocks to veto the light rail line coming through the neighborhood because they, they don't like one aspect of it or another. You know, one of the things, speaking of that, there's a, I wouldn't say, I used to say the lowest possible level that can competently make the decision. I think the better word is the most local level that can make the decision. Yes. I think that explains it better because it's geographically uh, it locates it geographically. And uh, the other thing about subsidiarity, which was taught to me by Bruce, uh, Bruce Donnelly, he says, you can also, it's the lowest level that concedes power to the next higher level. Okay, it's not the high le higher level that concedes decision to the lower level. It's the lower that concedes to the higher. And I think that's tremendously powerful. Yes. You know, we can't make it, we're only a household, but this can be made at the block, or we can't make it as a block, it, this, that's neighborhood level. Because you can't get elected officials to say, I will concede this to the lower level. That's not right, it's gotta move up. And that's a, that's a subtlety that I, um, I, I learned since, you, since we spoke last time. Wonderful. Thank you, Andres. And Chuck, in this last minute that we have, I want to echo some of the comments we've gotten on the chat and questions here, just thanking you for your participation today, um, giving us a lot to think about, and also in taking the Strong Towns message and making it relevant to current events. And that's really special. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. That's very kind. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's one question on here that says, do I realize how many concepts match the new urban vision for diverse interaction with communities? And I, I think it's important to, to just note along what you just said, um, I'm a new urbanist. Like I, I have been deeply influenced by Billy Hadaway, by Victor Dover, by Andre Stwani. I've been deeply influenced. And, and I, I do feel like our role as a movement, as a strong towns movement has been largely to uh, communicate new urbanist concepts and ideas to people who are outside of the new urbanism and do it in a way that, that brings them in or makes them amenable to the things that we as new urbanists want to see accomplished. So I, thank you for this opportunity. And, and please, all of our stuff on our website is community commons licensed. It's free for everybody to use, share, adapt. 
so, you know, make use of that resource so you can go out and, and build great, strong towns. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.